Hi everyone. This video is on how to learn a piece of music. Okay, so this is from the moment that you choose a piece to play or that you receive a piece of music that you are supposed to learn to, to that first performance. And I've been talking with colleagues about this. I've been making my own notes. I've also been um, just checking to make sure that my process is essentially the process of other professionals, and it turns out it is. We all generally do the same th kinds of things to, to efficiently learn a piece of music. The first thing we do is we listen. You know, we, we, we benefit from the due diligence of others. We know that um, a, a performance of a particular piece of music is, is steeped in tradition and especially if, if it were written during a particular time period. We, we want to hear how it was performed in that time period. We want to hear what other current artists are doing. We like to hear kind of new and different interpretations of the same piece. So we, we listen to as many sources as we can. And um, one thing I think that's very important when listening to the music is to listen to a, a good audio recording, preferably a recording, not a YouTube video, and, and, and be watching the score at the same time. So when you are looking at the music and you're listening at the same time, you're actually kind of taking what you're hearing and you can visually see what, what that performer is doing. You can hear, you can more easily hear um, tonal changes. You can more easily hear where there are particular shifts or where they're crossing strings or bowings. So what we do and what I do is I listen and I start marking, okay? So this is something that I, uh, an indispensable tool that I don't often think students use, okay? I say that because in my private lesson, in my private studio, when students show up in their music, I almost never see a single pencil mark. And I always ask the same question. I say, do you have pencils at your house? They say, yes. And I say, hmm. And I immediately start marking. So I'm gonna show you a close up. And this is Lieb's slide. I've been working on this for, to, to do a tutorial and I've been listening and I've been making some initial marks. Now this is just my first layer of markings. Okay, so when you look at the scores of, you know, teachers who've been teaching their whole lives, if you look at their parts of a sonata, of a concerto, it is full of markings. There are all kinds of things written in margins and, and over notes and, and symbols to mean, you know, various things from hold a note longer to cut a note off shorter, you know, dynamic markings. And this is basically, we're creating a map so that we are notating as much detail as we can into the music. That helps us to remember, it helps us train the body, train the muscles, okay? So if every time we practice, we're forgetting something, we don't have it marked, you know, it's just gonna take longer to learn. So listening and starting to mark general things like what you just saw on my on that page um, I marked um, you'll see that little comma after the second note I was listening to the recording by Chrysler who um, who wrote this piece and he put a little space after after that second note and so I notated that I also you can see at the top um, scrawled in my very messy handwriting rushed second beats. So he was playing this according to a style, an old kind of style when you have triple meter and the, the second and third beats are kind of rushed ahead a little bit. And the first, I'm sorry, the first two beats are rushed ahead a little bit. And then the third beat is held back. One, two, three, one, two, three. So I just made note of that. I don't think that's something I'm gonna do when, when playing and teaching this, but I just made a note of it. So the second part of this preparatory phase is making firm decisions about the bowings and fingerings you're gonna use. Or 
If you're a beginning player and you have the bowings and fingerings marked, you're going to make sure that you're committed to learning those right away. Okay, we're not going to waste any time playing incorrect bowings or playing incorrect fingerings. Okay, professionals know that is just a needless waste of time and we don't like wasting time practicing for sure. So if you're if you have bowings that are already marked, then reinforce those bowings. Add bow markings to the notes that don't have them printed, particularly the first beat or the first the first bow um, of each measure. That way, when you stop and you have to start up again, you know what bow you're supposed to be on. This is something that is ubiquitous to student playing. They'll stop for some reason, maybe they made a mistake, or just some slip up and they start again. They're not sure what bow they're supposed to be playing on, so they just play any bow. And oftentimes it's incorrect. They don't even know it's incorrect. I, as the teacher, stop and say, nope, you know, so that's a down bow. Professionals, and this happens in orchestra, you see this in, in orchestra playing a lot. If there's a stop, if the conductor stops, if we have to stop to work on something, when we start again, we know exactly what bow we're going to be on, an up bow or a down bow. And if it's not marked and if it's not clear, and you see this in orchestra a lot, is you, you, you just count backwards and you figure it out really quickly. You're like down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, so oftentimes if I um, stop and want to start again, if I don't know the bowing, I figure it out and then I mark it so that if I start there again, I know what bow I'm supposed to be on. For, for more advancing players, now's the time to start making really committed decisions about the bowings and fingerings you want to use. Okay, so for instance, back to the leaf slide. Um, in, in preparing this for tutorial, um, I, I listened and I decided to mark and commit at this point to um, the bowings of David Oystruck. I liked what he was doing. I, I saw a lot of good um, artistic reason for, for bowing it like this. So I changed the bowings to match what I saw him do uh, and heard him do and saw him do. There was a video. Um, so for instance, um, if you'll look here, I, I start with this printed on an up bow. This is hooked bowing. Now here, I had to change the bow to match his performance up and now a down. Another down bow. Okay, so I have all that marked in the part. And I'm, I'm gonna practice that for a while. I'm gonna, I've committed. And later I might change my mind. You can always change your mind about bowings and about fingerings at any stage, any point in the game. Even the day before a performance, you can change a fingering. I've, I've done that many times. But, but now I want to just have that consistency. I want to give this, this bowing pattern a chance. Um, so I, I'm going to be very, very uh, consistent about practicing it that way. Okay, so now we're going to move on to kind of the meat and potatoes of the learning process. Now we're to the nitty gritty part of practicing. That preparatory phase, you know, that's a two or three days worth of work. But now, now we are to the long months of practicing, of repetition, of isolating difficult passages and just working them. Okay, this is, a lot of people call this woodshedding. But I do want to distinguish between two kinds of playing. One is contextual, one is non-contextual. And, and I think it's important to realize what you're doing in, a, in, in the moment. So if you are playing through a piece, and that's certainly a valid practice technique is to play through your piece. That way you get an overview, you see what needs to be um, focused on. And as, so when you're playing contextually, even playing a melody in its entirety, adhere to the fingerings and bowings, okay? Don't, don't be messing with that, keep that consistency. 
non-contextual practice, when you're isolating and you're just practice, practicing a shift, or fast passage, we do. That's where we can change bowings. We can change um, the, the, the articulation. You know, we can change the rhythm. We can do all kinds of things to kind of raise the standard of our playing and of our technique. Okay, so that's skill building. But when we're playing contextually, when you're playing through your piece, you're playing through a phrase, then practice the dynamics, practice the bowings, play as if you're performing. Always play as if you're performing. Now I want to mention something I think um, for many of you, and I see this from your videos, I think that your, your main first stage of learning music is to memorize because your reading skills are not as advanced as your playing skills and you don't like the music holding or reading the music holding you back. So I think for many of you wanting to remove yourself from the music, it, it can just, it'll free you up. And then once you've learned it and once you know where the fingers go, then you can practice it more. That's okay. The problem though is that often, and I see this often, is that you're just memorizing what the notes, what the notes are. But you're memorizing incorrect bowings. You're, you're changing in the memory process, you're, you're forgetting, or maybe you didn't completely notice the first time, so rhythms are getting missed. And um, even individual notes are being changed, and then you're practicing it like that for a long time. So you're practicing all these incorrect things for a good long time. So that's, as you know, highly inefficient for practicing. So for those of you who don't have strong reading skills and who don't like having to tether to reading notes. Then what I suggest is <clears throat> at least to work on a small part a, a bit at, at a time. And, and even if you're not reading while you're playing, look at the phrase. So I'm just gonna pick a little phrase here. So now I may want to do it from memory, but I'm only just going to do a little bit to make sure I kept those same, same bowings. And I might even go back just to see, all right, did I indeed change the bow there? Is that the right rhythm? Did I get every single thing correct? So at least I encourage you to very frequently, frequently reference the music, okay? Because that's also where you're gonna have all your markings. You, that's, you're storing everything you don't need to be storing in your memory at this point. Memorization really should come at the, the very end of the process. But I know there are some of you who, um, whose reading skills are not advanced yet and so you find it difficult to play with the music. So find some middle ground to where you're not wasting time practicing incorrectly. All right, still in the nitty gritty. Okay, we have contextual playing. I recommend starting off your practice period by playing through the music. It may, you may make mistakes, but you will be gathering information and then you get your pencil and you put a little star next to the places you're gonna go back and really, really, really woodshed. You're gonna go back and do repetitions and use all the practice techniques that you've learned. I have lots of videos on practice techniques, all kinds of things you can do from very, very slow, slow practice, um, slow repetition. <laughs> Something I always practice shifts. If I have shifts in a piece, that's some, that's I isolate each shift and I just do repetitions of those shifts. So as I said, this 
This can go on for a very long time. You're just, you're building skill. You're learning how to play this piece well. And one very crucial step during this phase of learning where you are really building technique, that is to practice with a metronome, okay? I think this is something that students often don't do, and then maybe once or twice they pull the metronome out um, because someone reminds them of the importance. They practice a few times with the metronome, but that's not really, really building skill within the time, within the framework of time. So we are like dancers, okay? Dancers have choreographed steps. They always practice to music. Imagine that they didn't practice to music. Um, the reason they have the music on all the time is because they have to have a, a beat reference. So they know how to time their movements. Well, same goes, same goes for instrumentalist. You know, our, our movements are all a part of the choreography. So the direction of the bow, where you are in the bow, the string you're on, how you get to the next string, the shifts, all of those things occur within the framework of time and in a fairly strict um, framework of time. Obviously, we don't play metronomically, we don't perform that way, but we do want to be very rhythmical. And the only way we can do that is to practice regularly with a metronome. I would say a good 60% of your time should be with a metronome. So I would just turn it on when you start your piece, play through it with the metronome on, if not at tempo, close to a tempo, so that you can see which sections um, are not up to standard and which ones to concentrate on. And then during the non-contextual part of your practice session, you turn it on and you, you time your movements to, to the beat. So shifts, that's something that really we do have to time, work with timing. So, um, and here's just 120. And, you know, if I just work on a shift, I picked this one because for some reason I miss it um, sometimes. And there is a difference between a movement on one bow with one bow stroke, like a down bow or the same left hand movement on a different bow stroke. So going back to the importance of being consistent with your, your bowings, it, it's a different feel and, and it, it has a different uh, feel for timing. So in, in lead and slide, so that shift there starts on an up bow. So I will practice that shift to the beat. And then I will change, I'll do it at different tempos, you know, to kind of expand, expand my technique. And then same thing, you know, for any, any other difficult section, you definitely will use the metronome. And for me, I think the metronome has always been, you know, like a practice buddy. You know, it's, it's there, it's always talking to me, always giving me feedback, and sometimes I don't listen to it. I can have it on and it can be in the background, and then when it's time to listen, it's still there. So I would definitely get something that is loud, something you can hear. I think um, the, the metronomes that have a flashing light, a, a visual pitch reference, to me, they don't work at all. Um, and I, so I don't advise using just a flashing light. Definitely get something you can hear. And, 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 use, and use the metronome. So I think um, if you are in, in the middle stages of, of learning a piece and you've been working and you don't feel like it's getting as good as you want it to be, chances are you haven't really worked with you know, the, the timing. The, the very refined timing aspect of, of the movements of each, each step, each choreographed step of your piece. Also, I think it's important to periodically go back and listen. I think a lot of people, they listen initially and then they don't go back and listen to those recordings. So the deeper you go into learning the piece, the more detail you will pull out from from the recordings and from the performances. You will hear things now that you didn't 
here in the beginning. You'll hear nuances, you'll hear little things, um, little color changes, or you know, little phrasings that you didn't notice in, in the beginning. So now is the time to do that, to go back and listen and start making new layers of markings on the piece. So you're building, you're building a very richly detailed record map of, of, of your piece so that you have it. You have everything you need to know about that piece on your score. Okay, so now we, we move on to um, what I call the polish stage. Now we're to the hard part, the hard part of learning a piece. This is the polishing stage, and this is where a lot of people really never get to, or once they're there, they don't know what to do. This is where students lose steam. This is where we've plateaued. This is where we've played everything, kind of, we're kind of at our best, and it's really difficult to improve beyond a certain point. You feel like your technique is kind of maxed out. Presumably, you have spent an adequate amount of good, efficient practice time attending to every detail that you can possibly attend to. So you have already isolated spots and you have played each spot through many times listening for a host of different things. Obviously we have intonation. Obviously we have rhythmic accuracy. We have cleanliness of intonation. We have um, fluidity of string crossings. We have everything. You listen for everything. Okay, it's just like looking in the mirror before you go out and you're making sure you're going down the list. You know, hair, glasses, makeup, clothes. You know, you're, you're again, you're trying, you're, you're looking on such a detailed level. Now, now it's time to take that step back and try to see the overall, the big picture. So when I get to a polishing stage, and honestly it's not often, um, only if I really am going to perform something and, and as that's not frequent these days, um, I don't really have a lot of pieces to, to use as an example because right now I'm still in the learning phase of just about everything I'm doing. Um, but we'll just take my good old standby, only because I learned it so long ago and I've played it so many times, I feel like I'm in that, I'm always in that polishing phase. So our good old meditation from Tice. Okay, so there's a little brushing up work that needs to be done, but um, now what I want to do, and this is what I encourage you to do, is to listen to yourself um, as an audience member would listen, okay? So you're now not the critic, you are now trying to move away from that um, over analyzing every little detail. Now you just wanna listen for overall beauty, quality of sound, and um, conviction of phrasing, okay? so. You're listening to the big performance. You're listening to the big, for the bigger picture. So now I'm listening and I'm just keeping one thing in mind, okay? That is quality of tone, quality of tone, beauty of tone. Quality of tone means that it is in tune. Quality of tone means that you did get to the string that on that, to the, to the correct string at the right time. Quality of tone means that the note did start cleanly. Quality of tone means that there is, it is a part of a phrase structure. It's a part of phrase logic. You're not going to play one note too loud. Okay, so all of that has to do with beauty of sound, quality of tone. So that's the only thing to put in your mind. Let your subconscious deal with everything else. So now it's time for the subconscious to make little adjustments. All you're going to be doing is you're listening for quality of sound, beauty of tone. OK, 
Okay, so this wasn't as beautiful to me. Say, I, I wasn't listening at that moment. I wasn't thinking about my shift. I wasn't thinking about which Boeing I was supposed to be on. All that has been learned. I was just listening and just asking, is it beautiful? Is the quality of sound at its peak? So that's the simple question and the simple answer was no, it wasn't. Was that? No. And when, when a note is out of tune, it doesn't have as quality a sound as, as when it is in tune. The violin doesn't ring as well when a note is out of tune, so your subconscious picks up on that, and then your subconscious will kind of adjust to make it more in tune. So again, you're letting your subconscious work now. You are now on a different level, um, on a higher plane, on a transcendent plane of listening for beauty. So I'm always asking myself the same question. Can I make it more beautiful? Can I make it more beautiful? And then I just try to make it more beautiful. Um, I have found that to be very effective for kind of changing the game, um, for making it a new game. So I think that is, that's one thing you can do and there are there are so many other things um, we can do now that we have technology, you know? We can do all kinds of things that will help us break out of a plateau. And one thing to do is record yourself um, and, and then do this. Record yourself. Do not watch it right away, okay? Because likely you will be preoccupied with um, a few notes that you missed or you knew that you missed, you knew that wasn't correct, and that's what you'll be listening for when you watch a playback. So put some time between recording yourself and watching it played back. You'll get a, the, a better overall um, idea of how well, of how successful the performance was is if you, if you wait a little while. So then you wait two or three days, <clears throat> you take your pen and your piece of paper and you sit back with your legs crossed and you listen and you have your music in front of you and you just make some general notes like, hmm, I thought I was making a big crescendo there but it didn't really sound like it so I need to, I need to work on that. Or, you know, maybe I, it feels like I'm getting anxious or I'm pushing ahead in tempo at that area, okay, I'm gonna, measure at section C, I'm gonna work for kind of holding that back. And you're gonna listen for other things. Like you may hear some intonation um, issues that you didn't hear when you were practicing. It's like, oh, very informative. Hmm, I didn't, I, I thought that was in tune. Turns out it wasn't, I'm gonna to listen to that. So, so put that distance between recording yourself and evaluating and then make a list, make a new plan, redirect your practice. Now you have, now you've got a plan. That's what you're gonna do that week. You're, next week you're gonna make another recording, okay? And you're gonna look back, you're gonna take a few days, you're gonna listen back and say, all right, well, these things are going better, but something else now is happening, okay? Maybe, maybe this section is a little garbled, I'm not really, the notes aren't projecting well, so now I know I'm gonna work on that. So you just kind of keep going through these um, kind of layers of, of recording, listening, taking notes. Recording, listening, taking notes, redirecting practice. Another thing you can do, which is very valuable, is go ahead and upload your video to your YouTube channel, and then watch it, watch the playback, and change on the little settings icon, slow it down, slow it down to half speed. You'll still be able to hear the audio without the audio being distorted or changed. So that, then now you can see, you'll be able to see things you couldn't notice when you were playing and you couldn't notice when you were watching it at regular playback. 
and you may actually see where a finger didn't get to the string on time, or you'll see where there was a delay in your string crossing, or you'll see where you thought you were going to the frog and you didn't. So now you're gonna see everything kind of microscopically and it can be very, very informative. Obviously you can do this way back in the, you know, the nitty gritty um, uh, part, of, part of practicing. But, but this is also a way to sort of, again, kind of put some distance and bring your playing, your performance up, up a notch. And then finally, you want to take any opportunity you can to play for people, all right? Even if you don't plan on performing, playing for someone, making a video and posting it at Violin Lab is a way to improve. Okay, it just, it just does. We have a different intensity of focus when we're performing and getting practice at, practice at working through any kind of performance anxiety is good. The more you do it, the less anxious you'll become. And, and that way you can find out all kinds of things about that piece that you were not having issue with before. I can't tell you how many times I had no trouble playing something, practicing something, and then when I went to perform it, whew, you know, it, something just fell apart. And I wouldn't have anticipated it, but it revealed that I didn't completely know something. All right, that's how you find out what you really know and what you don't know about a piece is when you perform it. And usually the things that fall apart are the things that my brain never completely learned on its own. So um, take every opportunity to, to play it for someone, whether virtually or some, a friend or, or a family member. So I think that, you know, once, once you've gotten to this place, okay, now, now if you want, now it's time to truly memorize the piece. So memorization is something that comes as a natural occurrence of having practiced something so much that your body just knows it, okay? Your body, your mind, everything, you don't even have to think. So the, the pieces that are the little bits of things that I know well that I don't ever have to use music for, it's because my I don't even have to think about where my fingers go. They just know on such a deep level that I'll never, ever, ever play it incorrectly. So, you know, the opening of the G minor. I mean, how could I ever start that piece in any other way? about all I know that's completely from memory but that's how memorization should be you've played it just so many times that it's there and then maybe you it's 80% of the way there and you just have to go back and refresh or reteach yourself some things that maybe you've forgotten but this is not something that I require stu students to do um, I think it's if it's an important piece to you and it's something that you want to just be able to play for the rest of your life. I think getting to going ahead and really truly committing it to memory is, is a good thing to do. And it also, um, it, it will in the end help you transcend to a place of performance where you really can't get to with the music. I mean, we can, we can get to transcendent levels when we're reading and playing, but it's that last when you know something so well and you're performing it or you're playing it from memory, where I think you can truly forget the world and just exist and live in, in the sound and the beauty of the sound that you're making and, and really transcend and in love, love playing, playing the violin. But this should be the last thing, the last thing, because um, I think that it's, I think we're not capable as humans 
to really effectively memorize a piece unless our bodies can just do it automatically until we have such muscle memory until all that choreography has been learned you know and where you can almost do it and think of other th things at the same time it's learned on that kind of cellular level so i hope i hope this video will help help you in your in your journey and um, there may be some things that I've left out. And if there are questions that arise from this video, then, then I, I can make a follow-up.